Thank you for joining us this morning at the Heritage Foundation in our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. Uh, we would ask everyone here to check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. That's an especially appreciated courtesy. We are pleased today to be co-hosting our program with the Chamber of Digital Commerce, and we'll learn more about them as we go through our program. Uh, our internet viewers, of course, are welcome to send their comments to us as well during the presentation, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org, and we will post the program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. Hosting our discussion today is Dr. Norbert Michel. Dr. Michel is Research Fellow in Financial Regulations in our Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. He writes about housing finance, including the reform of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. He also focuses on the best way to address difficulties at large financial companies under the too-big-to-fail problem. And he researches monetary policy and other issues related to the Federal Reserve. Prior to joining us a year ago, he was a tenured professor at Nichols State University's College of Business. He has previously served as a tax policy analyst here at Heritage as well, and with the global energy company, Intergy. In spite of being a graduate of the University of New Orleans and Loyola University, he is a large supporter of U uh, LSU, which irritates some of the rest of us in the SEC. Please join me in welcoming Norbert Michel. Norbert. Thank you, John. Apparently, it's a sort of a right in Louisiana. The, the, the bulk of all LSU fans actually did not go to LSU to go to school. <laughs> and, and I do agree with John. There is a very good reason for that. However, uh, so good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the, the, I've, I've done several of, of these types of events here, usually on financial regulation and, and more monetary policy type dry issues. and. I've never had anybody on staff email me or call me before an event and say, hey, can I come to this? Do we have room for this? So th this, this Bitcoin thing was the opposite. Uh, I've had more of those phone calls and emails than I've ever had. Uh, so new technologies in general tend to, I'm sure, generate some excitement. And this has clearly been no exception. Uh, but they also tend to generate some disruption. And again, Bitcoin has been no exception to that rule. I think the peer-to-peer the -peer aspect of the technology in particular holds a great deal of promise because it allows people to transfer money directly without any intermediary. And that, of course, would have some people nervous. Uh, in one sense, this is, I think, very similar to many technologies in their nation stages. Uh, the, and, and more broadly, the internet itself in its nation stage. I think some people ignored it. Others insisted that it was more of a fad. Uh, some feared the potential for competition and change, and then other people embraced it. Uh, and eventually, of course, we know how the internet turned out. Uh, Bitcoin, I think, has a distinct aspect to the, the a distinct monetary aspect to the technology, though, that makes it a little bit different. Uh, and in this age, where we're used to government monopoly of money, uh, and where many people seem to have forgotten that money was actually created in private markets and then monopolized by the government, but I won't go too far down that road. Um, it, 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 it's a particularly useful reminder, I think, of human ingenuity uh, and things that we can do on our own and, and that we do do on our own. Uh, so there's no doubt that these digital currencies are still in their infancy, uh, and their outstanding value is relatively small compared to the U.S. dollar, only several billion uh, in, in Bitcoin and digital currencies, mostly Bitcoin. Uh, but these facts obscure, I think, the technology's main promise. And again, that is the, the ability to serve as an electronic payment network without any third-party financial intermediary. Um, I think we should also recognize that the, the focusing on the, on the small relative size sort of discounts the possibility of what entrepreneurs could actually do with the technology and how things could be sort of figured out and, and, and how things could play out as, as we let this thing spread. Uh, so it, it, it's certainly not used commonly yet, but that doesn't mean that it can't be or that it won't be. Uh, as far as I can tell, Bitcoin is the world's first privately created digital currency, digital currency uh, that's exchanged over the internet through peer-to-peer -peer network, has no government company or independent organization upholding its value or monitoring its use, yet its gains and losses are based purely on supply and demand. So it's because of those reasons, I think, that anyone who loves individual freedom 
uh, owes it to themselves to pay attention to the technology uh, and as well to the state and federal regulatory responses to the technology. And that's why we're here today. Uh, we hope that this event helps people do that. So uh, we'll all hopefully learn something uh, from our panelists. And I will run through a quick bio of our panelists, and then each of our panelists will give uh, a few minutes, 15, 20 minutes or so speech, and then we will open up to Q&A after that. So first, uh, we have our co-host, Perry Ann Boring, who's the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce, the first Washington, D.C.-based association dedicated to promoting the acceptance and use of Bitcoin and digital assets to public policymakers. Uh, Ms. Boring is a sought-after speaker and author of the Boring Bitcoin Report, which is not boring. <laughs> uh, popular, it's a popular industry blog. Uh, prior to, to forming the Digital Chamber, uh, Ms. Boring served as an economic analyst in Network Cable News and also worked on Capitol Hill as a legislative analyst uh, advising on finance, economics, tax, and health care policy. Uh, next, we will have Mr. George Gilder who is an active venture capital investor who's, of course, widely known for his writings uh, across a broad spectrum of topics, including technology, business knowledge, and the future of innovation. He's the founder of the Gilder Technology Report, and he's own, he also owns and has published, owned, past tense, sorry, uh, and published the American, Expect the American Spectator for three years. Uh, he's authored approximately 18 books, and uh, one of those, of course, is the bestseller Wealth and Poverty, which set the political landscape for the Reagan Revolution uh, and made him President Reagan's most quoted author. Uh, he's currently written, although it has not yet been published, a new book titled Bitcoin and Gold, where he is drawing parallels to the rise of Bitcoin today to the rise of gold at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, and we're not exactly sure, George isn't exactly sure when that's going to be out, but it's coming. Uh, and then lastly, we have uh, Ms. Carol Van Cleef, who is partner and co-chair of the Global Payments, Manat Phillips & Phillips. She has been a WestPay volunteer and regular speaker and contributor on the WestPay Third Party Sender Roundtable since 2011. She's co-chair of the Global Payments Practice Group and also a member of the financial services and banking practice at Minot Phelps and Phillips uh, here in DC. She's been a member of the NAC, oh. Somebody's in trouble, that's all. Uh, but it wasn't me, so. Uh, she, she's also a member of the NACH's Council for Le Electronic Billing and Payments and was the legal contributor to the NACH's uh, walk-in bill payments, guidelines for billers and walk-in payment providers. She represents banks and credit unions, mon money transmitters, third-party payment processors, digital currency-related ventures, and other financial service companies, providing them with legal and strategic advice on federal and state regulatory compliance and enforcement matters, also involving anti-money laundering and OFAC compliance, uh, data security, privacy, consumer protection, and other regulatory issues. Uh, she has a lot of details, and, and, and she will tell you about some of those. So uh, we will, we'll, again, we will start with Ms. Perry Ann. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for coming and for everyone that's uh, watching this uh, via uh, live stream. Uh, very excited to have uh, the, our first event with the Heritage Foundation, and I believe this is the first time that any D.C. think tank has ever held anything on Bitcoin. So it's great that the Washington community is finally recognizing this as a legitimate in, uh, industry and technology. Uh, I formed the Chamber of Digital Commerce uh, earlier this year to help build the, the case for Bitcoin and digital currencies here in Washington. I put together a few slides on what is this uh, magic internet money that has everybody uh, so curious uh, and also has uh, regulators starting to uh, get involved in uh, this industry. Uh, and this is a spin off an article I wrote for um, Forbes that was called uh, How Bitcoin Can Strengthen America and Why Washington Would Be Wise to Accept It. Okay. This isn't working. Um, you would think the... Um, 
I hear the control room moving. There you go. You gotta turn the it on. Thank you. Go. <laughs> it is a technology. <laughs> it is a technology panel. However, I'm an economist, not a technologist. <laughs> Uh, so according to the World Bank, 74% of the world's population does not have access to basic financial services. And even here in the United States, about 50% of the population is un- or underbanked. And this is why Bitcoin has and digital currencies have uh, really uh, sparked my interest as someone, uh, you know, as an economist. I recognize this and appreciate this from the economic points of view and how uh, this currency can strengthen our financial system. Uh, digital currencies like Bitcoin could increase the standard of living by increasing access to financial services around the world. And I'll quickly go over uh, how uh, we are building the case for this. Uh, I'll first talk about the uh, the Chamber of Digital Commerce, who we are and, and what we do. Uh, what is Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin safe? And Bitcoin today to give a basic overview of the industry and the regulatory environment. Uh, so the Chamber of Digital Commerce, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're a D.C.-based trade association. Uh, we provide authoritative information uh, to public policymakers on digital assets and currencies. Uh, so as a very brand new industry, uh, just this year, the industry has matured to the point that uh, leaders have decided we need to have formal representation here in Washington. And uh, our, that is our mission here with the Chamber. Uh, we do this through... Uh, and the, the reason why we felt the need to set up the chamber is because Washington was starting to take a big interest in uh, this disruptive technology. Um, on the, the, the far side, we have Senator Joe Manchin, who sent a letter to both Treasury Secretary Jack Lew and Attorney General Eric Holder asking for a ban on Bitcoin. Uh, so there's clearly been a lot of regulatory interest in this, and we want to clear up any misconceptions. Um, and uh, at a small business hearing, uh, Representative Richard Hanna asked... Uh, why do we need an imaginary currency? So another part of what we want to do at the Chamber is educate policymakers and federal workers on uh, how Bitcoin and these technologies can strengthen the financial system. Uh, and then uh, the Department of Homeland Security, along with 10 other federal agencies and departments, have jurisdiction over this technology and are diligently uh, looking to regulate this. So we have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that is issued an advisory uh, just last month. They're looking at this from a consumer point of view. Uh, we have the Security and Exchange Commission, who's already prosecuted two Bitcoin companies successfully. Department of Justice has... Um, uh, done a couple different operations, taking down some rogue players. Uh, we also have the CFTC uh, overseeing the commodities industry. They're having a public uh, discussion on Bitcoin next week, October 9th. So these are just a few examples of how there's many different players within the federal government that are getting involved with this industry. So you can see the need why it's important to have a central authority like the, the chamber to kind of bring um, um, cohesiveness to all these different efforts. Uh, and we do this through a three-pronged approach. We have a full-service government affairs office where we're working full-time uh, with the uh, U.S. Congress as well as federal agencies and departments. We also have a public affairs office. Um, if anyone has a question about Bitcoin, uh, nobody owns Bitcoin. So who do you call? There's no uh, headquarters. Uh, so we want to provide uh, a resource to the media as well. Unfortunately, there's been some scandals that have hit this industry from Silk Road and Mt. Gox, Liberty Reserve, you might have heard of some of these. We want to make sure the uh, the media has accurate information uh, if there were to be something like this happen again. Uh, and we also strive to be a resource to the public. We have all of our information, contact information readily available on our website. Uh, don't ever hesitate to contact us if you have some general questions uh, or regulatory questions about uh, our industry. Uh, we also have a third party coalition building grassroots effort that we uh, coordinate at the chamber. Uh, so moving on, what is Bitcoin? Uh, and this is a definition that I wrote in. Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer open source software based payment system based on its own unique currency called a Bitcoin. So uh, it just launched in 2009. It's only about five years old. So it was very much in its infancy. Uh, there's a lot of growing pains, road bumps that we're still uh, going through. So we expect there to be more hubbub, uh, more, more, um, 
these types of uh, things to emerge, uh, but we're diligently working through them. Um, and Bitcoin represents a large technological leap uh, because it's a payment system, a network, and a currency. Um, digital currencies have been around since at least the 80s, and uh, Carol has been uh, working as industry for uh, you know, way before Bitcoin's existence, and she can go more detail of that. Um, but the, what's different about Bitcoin, it is a math-based finite digital asset, meaning you can't copy and paste it. And this was a huge technological leap because it solved the uh, ever um, double spend problem, which uh, previous digital currencies uh, were battling. Uh, so with Bitcoin, we are able to, um, there's 21 million, it's capped at, there's only 21 million uh, Bitcoins in existence. Uh, so it doesn't suffer from the same inflationary issues that government issued uh, fiat currencies are experiencing today. Um, and, uh, and you can just imagine the type of monetary policy benefits that can bring to a financial system. Um, it's also not controlled by a central authority, and it, uh, anybody can use it for free. And that's why uh, Bitcoin could provide access in so many different uh, emerging markets around the world, people who are underbanked. Anybody can use Bitcoin if you have access to the Internet. Uh, you don't, uh, it doesn't matter if you have a bad credit score, if you've, uh, you've gone through bankruptcy, anybody can use uh, Bitcoin. And in the emerging markets where uh, we don't have the same type of sophisticated uh, financial systems that we have in the United States, the industry is currently building up the infrastructure for Bitcoin to mobile payments. So uh, around the world, more people have access to cell phones than running water. And through this uh, mobile payment infrastructure, uh, we are forecasting that Bitcoin could bring uh, billions of people uh, into the global economy. Uh, so is Bitcoin safe? Uh, there's been several scandals uh, that I'm sure, sure, I'm sure many of you have uh, heard from Silk Road, Liberty Reserve, Mt. Gox. A lot of people question, is this something we can use? Uh, I want to make sure that we understand there's a distinction between Bitcoin, the, the protocol, the actual software, and the companies that operate on top of that software. Uh, some of these individual companies have seen uh, failures and there are, are, like any other industry, rogue players. Uh, but Bitcoin itself will go through just a couple of facts. Uh, Bitcoin has never been hacked. So unlike a uh, you know, credit card company, uh, for example, the Target hacked, because uh, these companies have one central authority that is uh, managing the transactions, uh, it makes it very vulnerable to hackers. But with Bitcoin on a decentralized ledger, it's very, very difficult to hack into that. And today we have not seen any hackings to the protocol itself. Uh, but because there is very little uh, regulation and consumer protection or best practices, it places a great amount of responsibility on its users. Uh, and that was kind of the issues that we saw with Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox was uh, one time the largest Bitcoin exchange, a place where people were going to buy and sell uh, Bitcoin. And that exchange lost uh, about half a billion dollars of customer funds. Um, and because this is a very new industry, there was no regulation behind uh, the exchanges. It failed and a lot of people People lost uh, a lot of money. But if you study Mt. Gox, they had security breaches that went all the way back to 2011 where they were losing customer funds, but customers still voluntarily chose to leave money with this institution. So as a responsible investor, they should have known that this was not a safe institution to store funds. But at the same time, there was no uh, regulatory authority that was calling them out saying they're having security problems. So these are kind of some of the growing pains that we're going through um, and where where organizations like the Chamber of Digital Commerce can start proposing uh, industry self uh, best practices uh, to strengthen these types of issues. Um. And then I'll give a brief overview of what uh, Bitcoin looks like today. There's approximately uh, 63,000 businesses that accept Bitcoin. This includes Dell, Expedia, Dish, and Overstock. Uh, just in the past couple of weeks, we've also seen some very notable uh, nonprofit organizations begin accepting Bitcoin, Greenpeace, and also United Way are now using Bitcoin. Uh, there's approximately 100,000 businesses that will be accepting Bitcoin by the end of the year. And uh, about $300 million in venture capital has been invested in this space in the past 12 months, which is draws a lot of close parallels to the investment community at the early stages of the internet. 
Uh, there's also about 200 ATMs worldwide as of today. The very first one was just deployed last year, so this was a huge step, and it provides uh, a great point of access to uh, uh, exchange uh, other currencies to start using uh, Bitcoin. Um, and this is a, a graph that was actually put together by Coindesk of the major companies in this space. You have wallet providers at the top. Those are where you would uh, hold and store your uh, Bitcoins online. Uh, exchanges is where you go to buy and sell Bitcoins. Again, those are, are not well regulated uh, and they can be risky. So if you um, want a, a place that is uh, totally uh, AML, uh, anti-money laundering, and uh, know your customer compliance, the best, way to play to go, the best place to go to buy and sell Bitcoin would be at some of the universal uh, circle coin base, coin plug uh, type organizations that comply with uh, modern financial regulation. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, we have uh, a set of ATM, Bitcoin ATM companies from Lamasu on the financial services side. Uh, miners, that's uh, kind of complicated, but uh, the companies that process transactions, uh, they are the ones who are really providing the uh, processing power to the network, which is also a very profitable part of, part of the industry. Uh, and then payment processing. Uh, while anybody can uh, accept uh, Bitcoin for free, there are several companies that specialize in payment processing. If you have a company and you want to start utilizing these services, they come in and they set it up for you for a small fee. Um, and uh, that's the completion of my uh, overview of Bitcoin. We'll save questions to the end, uh, but thank you very much. George, uh, George is going to go next, I think, is it? I knew George was going to come back. <laughs> well, I wanted to see the... We're at, we're at Heritage today and uh, to talk about Bitcoin. And why should Bitcoin be of interest to Heritage? Uh, Heritage is a conservative organization that tends to uh, support the... Uh, Dollar, the existing uh, financial structure to some degree of why is there a fundamental need for conservatives to confront the Bitcoin challenge and Bitcoin opportunity? I think it's because of a fundamental problem in uh, the ideology, economic ideology that originated with one of all our heroes, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman was the great exponent of libertarian and conservative economics, really probably the greatest of, of uh, this era. And uh, yet there was a fundamental division between his libertarian affirmations of celebrations of human freedom, and his monetary theory that assumed that uh, money was a necessarily a centralized function of, of governments. And this uh, division has really paralyzed conservatives in addressing the issues of money. Uh, when I was in uh, China with... Friedman uh, a couple decades ago in 1988, 19, uh, uh, we, uh, his chief advice for the communist government of uh, China at that time was get control of the, your money supply. And uh, he believed that uh, money was necessarily a centralized function, and it derived from his canonical formula, MV equals PT, that is money times velocity of money, turnover of money equals prices times transactions or general, general nominal output across the economy, roughly. And uh, the reason uh, his... Uh, Focus, though, was on the money supply. He believed M ruled, and MV equals PT. He believed the money supply ruled, 
that velocity was kind of a psychological factor that was exogenous to the system, that, uh, that the money supply itself uh, ruled the economy and uh, you had to have some kind of central governance of uh, the money supply. And uh, the last 20 years have almost completely demolished these assumptions. Uh, the velocity has been wildly gyrating for the last uh, 20 years. Um, in, in 10 years before in Japan, where uh, there was a vast quadrupling of the money supply with virtually no impact on economic activity. As it turns out, V is how we control money. And, if, and uh, fundamentally, we've demonstrated uh, over the last 20 years that the people essentially do control money. And thus, you do not need to have uh, centralized management of, of money. Uh, that uh, indeed, a system like Bitcoin, and I think Bitcoin is an exemplary uh, digital uh, a breakthrough uh, is uh, an appropriate and desirable uh, resolution of the monetary dilemma that arose with the rise of monetarism uh, within uh, conservative circles. And it's embraced by uh, Keynesians as well. Paul Krugman today is the most passionate exponent of uh, of Friedman's monetarism. He is, uh, uh, he, he believes, he cites Friedman regularly in his books and, uh, and uh, says that, the, that this is, that this need for centralized control of money is uh, the crucial, uh, crucial to economic growth and expansion, and and uh, other conservatives and liberals join in believing that the money supply has to expand regularly in order to have economic accommodate economic growth. Again, uh, this is only true if velocity is a constant as. Uh, if velocity can uh, adapt to whatever monetary conditions obtain, uh, then uh, the steady expansion of the money supply is not uh, needed in order to accommodate economic growth. Uh, my last book, Knowledge and Power, uh, explored the information theory of money and, and, it, uh, and the information theory of capitalism. And the heart of it was that uh, wealth is knowledge. Uh, we can t tell that because uh, material resources haven't expanded since uh, the age of, since the Stone Age. All the difference from between our age and the Stone Age is the growth of knowledge. Knowledge is wealth. And uh, growth is learning. And uh, there are uh, any uh, capitalist economy is uh, pervaded with learning curves. Uh, every business consultancy uh, has uh, supports, all the major business consultancies support the concept of the learning curve that shows that with every doubling of total units sold, uh, costs drop between 20 and 30%. This means that capitalism is intrinsically deflationary because uh, growth is learning and uh, the, throughout uh, uh, capitalist economies, businesses are launching learning curves and that's how they uh, advance their, uh, expand their um, commerce. So, uh, what we have here is a real crisis of conservative economics that uh, focuses on money, and we have a solution to this crisis, 
namely Bitcoin, which is emerging from the Internet and represents really a next step in Internet infrastructure. And, and because Internet, uh, Internet currently only comprises about 6% of global commerce, uh, uh, a new infrastructure of the Internet does not threaten the whole structure of global currencies. It's a necessary next step for Internet commerce. It's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's global, it's distributed, and it uh, thus uh, is perfectly adaptable to a global internet that increasingly has to uh, accommodate uh, commerce from around the globe. The, uh, it's also an advance in information theory. Information theory is really the foundation of the internet and of the computer age. Uh, Claude Shannon is the most notable exponent of it. In 1948, he he developed uh, uh, the information theory as a way to gauge the uh, bandwidth of networks. And uh, in order to build global networks, you need to be able to measure information, which is what is passed across global networks, and his measure of information was chiefly surprisal, that is, unexpected bits. Uh, if everything I tell you today you already know, uh, no information is being transmitted. Information is unexpected bits. And I believe that uh, the Internet today suffers from uh, uh, the limitations of Shannon information. Uh, all across the network we have uh, uh, information that is not qualitatively differentiated. It is measured only by, or chiefly by, its unexpectedness. And uh, Bitcoin represents a new step in in information theory that allows the internet not only to uh, uh, transmit information in Shannon terms, raw bits and bytes, but also to have uh, provable transactions, contracts, titles, time-stamped data, provable facts, uh, patents, uh, all the various uh, instruments of uh, commercial civilization are not really possible today on the Internet without uh, uh, resort to parties beyond the Internet. And uh, by uh, incorporating Bitcoin, uh, we can uh, move to a new generation of Internet commerce that uh, can accommodate an Internet of Things where you have constant transactions between machines that uh, can't readily um, tap uh, resources outside the Internet or, or uh, uh, run their transactions through banks. We can have micropayments which are critical to avoiding the current corruption of the Internet by the constant promise of free goods. Uh, free goods are uh, uh, a contradiction in terms. There's no such thing. And so because the Internet is constantly driven to offer free goods in the absence of micropayments that were uh, suitable to small uh, transactions. Uh, we have uh, a constant offer of free things in exchange for uh, our mother's maiden name, the last four numbers in our social security uh, number, the security codes on our credit cards. Uh, in order to do a transaction in the internet, we really have to uh, relinquish enough information to allow our our uh, very identities to be fished or usurped. So uh, there's uh, 
of a real crisis at the internet and on the internet that is the counterpart of the inter crisis in global currencies uh, that uh, brought down the world economy over the last uh, 10 years and that has uh, plunged the world into economic stagnation uh, over the last few years. And uh, the current uh, financial system is uh, really uh, preposterous on the surface if you, if you uh, contemplate it. Uh, most of the big banks, the Wall Street, really likes volatile, volatile currencies. Uh, it uh, likes currency volatility with the downsides protected by government. Main Street and Silicon Valley want stable currencies for long-term commitments with the uh, upside protected by the rule of law. And uh, what uh, the future of our economy will depend on whether the power brokers chiefly prevail in, uh, with uh, volatile currencies uh, that uh, and currency trading, which now really dominates uh, financial transactions in the world, uh, the currency trading is a hundred times larger than all the trading in the stock markets put together. It's 25 times larger than all the world trade in goods and services. It's, uh, it's preposterous that most of the transactions in the world revolve around uh, shuffling currencies back and forth. And uh, this is, uh, uh, and uh, the banks that really uh, focus on trading currencies, uh, we're not gonna tell you this, but this is, is really is uh, a crisis of the world economy, and uh, we need stable, long-term money to accommodate long-term commitments of, of new learning curves of capitalism. And I think Bitcoin is uh, the open-sourced, uh, distributed, global system that uh, will start as infrastructure for the internet and new information th theoretical advances for the internet and then will grow as internet commerce grows as enabled by a new uh, infrastructure for our global networks. Thank you. Thank you, George. And Carol is our next panelist. I have to admit I'm starting at a little bit of a disadvantage because I don't have a report uh, behind my name. Um, but I do have something in this world that actually may, in the world we're talking about here, that may be more important. Um, thanks to the FinCEN, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, in March of uh, 2013, uh, they coined a phrase uh, by which they uh, are analyzing uh, the, the types of things we've been talking about today. And they have coined that they've talked about virtual currencies and they've said, you know, the real issue of whether they're regulated by FinCEN or not is whether they are convertible or non-convertible. So there is this now concept of convertible virtual currency CVC. And if you notice, my initials are CVC. So I don't have a report, but I have, I have the, uh, the acronym. <laughs> so with that, um, first thing I'd like to do is ask how many of you in the room actually own some Bitcoin? One, two, three, four. Okay, how about another type of cryptocurrency? What kind do you own? Litecoin, I have, I have Bitcoin, a little bit of Dogecoin. Okay, and we've got... Just Bitcoin. Okay. Um, and have you ever experimented with other types of digital currencies? No. Okay. Well, it's a good starting point because if you really want to understand what we're talking about here, um, Perry Ann gave you a list of several different companies that, that are good places to go and start. And the best thing you can do is actually go online and get some. You don't have to buy much. You can buy 
a dollar's worth or ten dollars worth or whatever if you want to but you can start to work with it and see what it is it actually can do and what you can you know how you can use it to purchase goods or services how easy it is to make make a a, a purchase or an exchange as we uh, we call it um, what I want to do is I want to focus on three or four issues right now. I typically can take up an hour and a half to two hours easily on my own uh, running through the, the legal and regulatory structure, but I'm not going to do that to you today. <laughs> but I want to say is that, that we're, we're not, we're, this isn't a vacuum we're operating within. This is not, despite the energy and excitement within the Bitcoin world, this is not something brand new. We've been at, in the world of digital currency for at least almost, well, almost 20 years now. The first round of digital currencies came forth in 2000, or 1995 as the internet was really first taking hold and was, you know, the, 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 you could just see the potential of the, of the internet for, for commerce. Uh, and with that, there were several bold experiments, some of them extraordinarily well-funded, and only one of those four, and I, I'd say it's four major ones, survived into the 2000s. And as we moved into the middle of the 2000s, policy makers were clearly taking note of the rise of this concept of digital currency. And in fact, in the first money laundering threat assessment put out by the United States Department of Treasury in 2005, they devoted a special section to the issue of digital currencies. So it was on their radar screen. And then we saw the first action in late 2005 um, when the Secret Service moved in and did a seizure of, of a company called e Gold, E hyphen G O L D. And uh, eventually an indictment of E Gold and, uh, and an ultimate plea agreement. And at sentencing, um, the judge in, at the end of 2008 made a couple of very interesting observations. One, she said, this system is not illegal. So right there, that's an interesting affirmation that you, know, you have a judge looking at it coming off of a criminal proceeding saying the system itself is not illegal. Second, is she made a comment that the, 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 the people behind it were not, didn't, didn't really, she didn't think they had illegal intent. But what they did is they put something out there that proved to be so good to criminals, so useful to criminals, and they didn't pull back in time to make changes around that system. Uh, and put controls into place. Uh, and, and then she also made some comments, and this is, I'm a little bit prejudiced myself being a lawyer here, but she made a comment that they didn't have good legal advice. And that's what we often find in this area. You look at young companies in particular, that it often what, you know, the, 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 um, the purchase of, of different types of services, including legal services, is often de is, uh, determined by budget. And so you have young companies that don't have a lot to spend, don't want to necessarily spend their money on lawyers, venture capitalists don't either, and you end up with some, you, some advice being given that may not be the best guidance for an organization. Um, so there's a lot, of, lot to be learned from this case. And in fact, and I asked Perry Ann right before we came on today, I said, have you looked at uh, the latest press today? Because uh, as we know in this world, everything changes very rapidly. So sure enough, I pulled up on my, uh, if you saw me on my iPhone, it was for good purposes, is that uh, yesterday or in the last couple of days, the head of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, gave an interview to a publication called Coindesk uh, about the views of her agency in digital currency. And she said, you know, we're really agnostic to, you know, we're not out to get um, uh, this world of digital currencies and Bitcoin in particular. Um, we're, we're agnostic to the technology. But, you know, what we're looking at is what happens with a financial product or service and how it can be basically used or abused by the criminal community. Uh, and that's the focus from one, and she then said, you know, we're only looking at one slice of this world. But that's essentially what we had in the Eagle case, going back, you know, several years ago now, moving into, into the world that we're living in now. So I do, as Perry Ann said, I come to the table with a, a slightly different perspective. Uh, and I've also worked very much in the money transmission world, uh, which is something that, going back again to the Eagle case, the Department of Justice said, we believe digital currency systems 
systems. Digital currency should be regulated as money transmission and as uh, money service businesses. So money transmissions under state law and money service businesses under federal law. Um, interestingly enough, it took FinCEN five years to come out with interpretive guidance, which was the one uh, in March of 2013, when it, fi it said, oh, by the way, these convertible virtual currencies, CVC, you won't forget me now, uh, <laughs> uh, is um, uh, that, that uh, they are supposed to be uh, you know, treated as money service businesses. Particularly, they looked at, it, at certain functions, and the exchange function in particular is what they focused on. Uh, the ability to go in and out of that convertibility from fiat currency into a cryptocurrency or, or back from the cryptocurrency into fiat. Now, a real interesting question is, what about going from crypto to crypto, which we're seeing more of these days? How does that get regulated? And uh, FinCEN hasn't uh, hasn't made any pronouncements on that point yet, but I'm, I would hazard a guess of how that one's going to come out. So as I said, we're not operating in a vacuum. Uh, and that plays out in multiple ways, because if you look at the issues that Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin ecosphere is experiencing right now, is you know, how do you deal with money, state money transmission licensing issues? can be extraordinarily expensive. Um, how do you, are we a money service business or not? Do we have to register with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network? Are we subject to the Bank Secrecy Act? And if we do, then how are we subject to the Bank Secrecy Act? Record keeping and reporting requirements. Do we file, you know, when do we file currency transaction reports? Well, currency transaction reports are filed when you have cash not when you're exchanging um, uh, cryptocurrencies, digital currencies. Um, when do we file suspicious activity reports? These are very, these are very fundamental pieces of our anti-money laundering compliance structure in the United States and actually around the world now. Um, so another, another issue that comes up is um, uh, I guess I'd start with saying, is Bitcoin really new? And we've talked about, you know, that there have been digital currencies before this. Um, what is different here is this decentralized nature, that there is no sort of there, there, as, as Perry Ann said. There is no central authority that's issuing the currency that you can turn to if there's an issue with the currency. Um, and so that presents some interesting and unique challenges from a regulatory perspective. But the regulatory framework we have in place in this country uh, in the financial services area has been used to for many years now in dealing with new and innovative processes, uh, uh, products and services. And so they're not unaccustomed to looking at, you know, how does this new thing fit into our existing form of regulation, which is a very different perspective than a lot ha of a lot of people in the in the cryptocurrency world is to say, well, we have something new and the laws don't deal with it. And I come at it in a different way is that you need to understand what the laws are and how you may fit within those. Because if you don't, that you're not you're not necessarily immune to it. So Again, looking at what the Department of Justice did in the Eagle case is to say, well, you know, you're not really that far out of the norm in, in, in several areas. We've seen the SEC um, deal with some Bitcoin-related ventures, and they've done it in the context of, of existing laws. We've seen just in the past week the Federal Trade Commission take action against a, a Bitcoin mining company a comp or a company that produced Bitcoin mining machines. And I had an opportunity to see a FTC commissioner yesterday uh, and ask her the question of, you know, well, what about this case? You know, what's sort of new? And her comment was, and you have to understand that this was not an entity that was in, in, um, in, the, in the mining business, though they are using their own machines. That's the latest claim to, to machines they were supposed to be delivering to other people uh, to mine for themselves. Um, but she basically said, you know, this case, even though it was all about, you know, a Bitcoin miner, great, interesting new things, it was actually a really mundane case. Yeah. It was, it was just, it was a case of somebody made representations to consumers and weren't able to follow through. It was unfair and, and deceptive practices. And I introduced that at issue to the Bitcoin community back in January of, of this year. And I had the most puzzled looks in, on, on the faces of people who were attending this conference, probably about 400, 500 people in the audience at the time. But 
Yeah, that's another example of existing laws that are getting applied uh, in the world that we have. For those of you who may or may not be aware, the CFTC uh, in just the past week had, or two weeks, I think, has approved uh, the first Bitcoin derivative uh, or crypto derivative product, and there's hearings that are coming up in the next month. So here again, we're seeing how policymakers are shifting. Now, what is the biggest area that is holding back um, the world of digital currencies right now in the United States? It's probably single-handedly the bank regulators. And the bank regulators don't have a direct um, piece of action here, but what they have done is they've made it pretty clear to their regulatees that Providing, uh, providing banking services, bank accounts, especially to the exchangers, sort of that necessary piece to make, you know, to, to introduce and get the circulation of, of the cryptocurrencies going, that they're not, they really aren't welcomed in the banking system, that we don't want them to have a bank account so that when they collect that fiat currency, they need some place to put it. Where are they going to put it? Well, they're having a very difficult, difficult time getting and maintaining uh, banking relationships. In addition, we've also seen evidence of, of banks closing accounts of customers who are just merely buying um, Bitcoin. Now, I just told you, you know, you need to go buy some <laughs> to, uh, to be able to understand how all of this works. But, you, but you know, there, is, they are, there are some banks that have taken steps to close uh, customer accounts if they see regular activity to and from certain of the Bitcoin, known Bitcoin uh, entities. How do they usually find it out? Well, often it's in the name. Um, you know, there's either coin or Bitcoin that's used in, in the term. So um, last thing I'd like to leave you with, and, and um, I don't want to take up the time for uh, discussion, is, um, is this issue of how do you really go about analyzing uh, the, the currencies and deciding how, how the laws apply. And what I have offered to people is a, is a construct of about uh, uh, 10 characteristics, 8 to 10 characteristics, um, that are important in looking at this broad class of digital currencies, which really do include not just the cryptocurrencies, the bitcoins of the world, but they also include you know, other uh, centralized, what we call centralized uh, digital currencies, as well as, and I didn't ask the question, I asked you if you own bitcoin or cryptocurrency, but do you own any, or do you have any virtual currencies from virtual games. If you play virtual games or if you have children who play virtual games, often they have currencies in, that are in-game currencies. And those, that's another class of, of currencies uh, in this world. So some of the issues you want to look at, are they centralized or decentralized currencies or currency systems? So as we, we <coughs> have established that Bitcoin and many of the other cryptos are decentralized, but we see some cryptocurrency systems that are coming out that are, in fact, centralized. Second, are they reserved or are they not reserved? Are they backed by anything, or is it just consumer demand that sets the price, which is what is the case in Bitcoin? But in, in some of the digital currencies and uh, some systems we're going to see emerging, you're going to see that they're backed by commodities. There's, a, there's one called VEN, which is backed by a basket of of um, um, fiat currencies, uh, as well as carbon credits. There's another system uh, called the Global Standard System that's gold-backed. Um, so we're going to see different types of iterations there. The um, finality of settlement is a huge issue. And in most of these systems, the finality is, is, is you know, you when you Make your payment just like in the cash world, the payment's made. That's a huge attraction to the merchants. Um, uh, uh, and there are other types of characteristics like that, that as you start to progress and, and learn and separate out, you know, these, are, these are points that you're going to want to look at. And I'd leave you with the last thought of, um, of uh, the term Bitcoin. Um, I, I don't have any slides with me. But I often will put up a slide that it's the capital B Bitcoin versus the small b Bitcoin. And it's important for you to understand what we're talking about here. And we've heard bits and pieces, no pun intended, of the, of, of the capital B and the small b here today. The small b is when Bitcoin is used as a currency, when it is used as a value of exchange, when it's used to purchase goods or services online. The capital B is the protocol. 
And I think that's where we're seeing a great deal of energy now is in the protocol of Bitcoin. It goes to a lot of what George was talking about, of building out this new infrastructure for the, for the Internet. Um, that there are a lot of different types of ways that, that, that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies can be deployed from a protocol standpoint to whether it's in the concept people talk about smart contracts, um, but different ways to, to transfer information. And this is where we're going to see some incredibly exciting developments, I think, in the, in the, in the very near future. Um, and I, if you want to learn more about this, I would point you to some, some uh, writings by uh, Vitalik Buterin. Uh, does anyone know, have they heard of Vitalik before? This is a brilliant young man, 20 years old, who uh, has the wisdom of people probably three and four times his age, uh, I've found on many occasions. Um, he has, he's a co-founder of a company called Ethereum which is building on top of the, the Bitcoin protocol, the blockchain, establishing its own, uh, own protocol. Um, they're putting out what they call Ether. And compare it to Bitcoin, it's the same kind of concept, but what they're calling it is crypto fuel. That this Ether is what's necessary to make what they're building out, which is an information transfer system, um, uh, it makes it work. It is the fuel, like putting the fuel into your car. So I, I challenge you to think about the world we're in and, and make sure that you separate you know, the capital B from the small b and keep in mind that it's not just going to be the you know, world of the cryptocurrencies, but there will be other types of currencies that we're going to see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we, we do have some time for some question and answers. And uh, I think... Actually, I don't know where the, here we go. All right, so we have a, a microphone coming around and I would just ask if you would please just state your name and affiliation and then ask your question, if you could. Hi, uh, uh, Omar Falls of the Carl Menger Center. Um, I have a question for uh, Mrs. Van Cleef um, with regard to the, uh, the banking issue. I had kind of the same experience when I linked my bank account to a Coinbase account the next day I got a call from my bank. They didn't leave a message, but I assume it was in relation to that. Do you foresee any of the exchanges or wallet providers or payment providers uh, potentially either themselves becoming banks or creating banking subsidiaries to kind of get around that problem? Because it seems that there would be a first mover advantage for any uh, Bitcoin related business that became a bank to, to provide those types of services. It's a great question and I think that the issue has certainly been raised in the, in the Bitcoin world. Uh, should we just go start our own bank? Um, having been in and around the banking industry for way too many years now, um, uh, I can tell you that there, it, that's, that's probably the slowest path to <laughs> deployment of anything at this point in time. Uh, the bank regulators are not comfortable with the concept yet. I think the major challenge before the world of digital currency is to establish a, a comfort level within uh, the banking regulatory community. Um, uh, once that's, that happens, then maybe we can start to talk about banks, you know, being able to offer accounts. Um, getting to the point where you can have a bank that's dedicated to that, it's a, it's a very difficult road to, uh, to go down. Uh, we've seen special purpose banks established in the credit card industry in the past, but even that fell out of disfavor with the banking regulators as we, you know, we're getting closer and closer to the financial crisis. They didn't like single focused banks. There's been efforts to establish banks for money transmitters in the past to specialize in that. Uh, and again and again and again, those efforts have failed. There have been existing banks that have tried to go in that direction, and one of them, in fact, recently was uh, the subject of a very significant enforcement action. Um, we've seen this in the prepaid industry, uh, and there is one uh, experiment, but it took the, took the uh, organizers around that um, a long time, several years, to finally get the, the banking charter that they wanted. Uh, so it's not, it's not an immediate panacea in any way. Thank you. I don't think a bank makes any sense with respect to Bitcoin at all, period. It means giving up control of your Bitcoins. It means giving them your private key. It means that you're unable to actually secure your own money. 
means you're, you're centralizing a decentralized currency. So what would be the point of a bank being involved with it at all? I'll take it unless well, you didn't give it to me. Go ahead. Well, the exchanges really are, are banks. And uh, there's that uh, Bitcoin does have to interconnect with the uh, real world. It can't be completely um, digital, part of the internet. It it has to um, have an apparatus of exchanges that is resembles uh, banking, and uh, <coughs> thus. Uh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. What? It does not. Well. How would you do it? You make you make a liquidity play. You just simply build. You simply build mechanisms whereby you're able to uh, interchange currencies within a, within a security. For example, um, if you're on the Isle of Man right now, mm -hmm. you can build a security that will allow you to collect dollars, euros, pounds, bitcoins, etc. And you build enough liquidity. If anybody wants dollars, whatever they want. For your, your bitcoins, they can do it then and there. The regulatory framework there is not like New York, not like the United States, mm. um, and simply as the uh, number of transactions increase, and they are increasing, even though the value of bitcoin is only five or six billion dollars at the moment, mm. uh, you would need to worry about uh, the exchanges. You are basically holding bitcoin and uh, other currencies interchangeably within that security. The insurance industry does it all the time, offshore. No. Um, so it seems to me that whole, giving somebody access to your private keys gives access to the government and the other third party to control your Bitcoin. And the point of Bitcoin is decentralized yeah. Yeah. ledger, which is not completely anonymous. It's wide open. You can see the transactions going on. And the fact that there is no one controlling your currency. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is this. We've been, we've been talking about Bitcoin being a currency. The IRS has come out and told us that Bitcoin is not a currency. It's an asset, um, which makes it even more interesting because which is it, fish or fowl? Is it, is it a currency or is it, is it an asset? Which one? I think it's that the, if I can take that, uh, I think the IRS um, uh, ruling uh, has certainly caused a lot of confusion amongst people. It's very important to keep in mind that uh, a term, a thing, can be defined in multiple ways under U.S. law. So for the current purposes and for what IRS was intending to address, they made that determination that it is property. It is very possible at some point in the future it may determine that Bitcoin or some other type of a digital currency is in fact a currency. And so you may see a change in that. But it, the ruling that it made based on the facts it had available to it at the time is that it, did, it didn't feel that there were enough indicia to put it into the currency world. That doesn't mean that when you start talking with money transmitters and you start talking about the functions that the exchangers play uh, and other players in the ecosphere, that they're not engaging in what would be a money transmission activity. We've had a couple of court decisions recently that have come out that have, have uh, you know, you can add it to the list of, well, it's money for purposes of the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, you've had the securities, uh, you've had uh, some rulings in the securities world that it's a security. It depends on what the function of it is and who's looking at it. It's sort of like that you go to a, do you know, you, something's wrong with you and you go to a doctor and if you go see the neurosurgeon, it's going to be something in your brain. If you go see the heart surgeon, it'll be something in your heart. And if it's, if you go see a, a kidney doctor, it'll be your kidneys. Yeah. So it well, sense? I mean, you could get, get um, capital gains in yen and and euros and dollars and 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 bitcoins it's it's, it's right. not uh, no gains what? there's no capital gains in euros and in, you know. I mean if you if you uh, conduct a business and you're uh, and currency you gain profits ordinary. from your it's, it's ordinary. what currency is always ordinary there's de, minimis provo there's de minimis provisions, but those don't exist for Bitcoin or digital currencies. Right, because the Bitcoin is not a currency. Bitcoin is property. Yeah. I, I, I just want to say also the idea that the um, that uh, Bitcoin is 
property and not currency is pur purely for purposes of its classification for tax purposes, whether you get capital gain or not. It doesn't have any, it doesn't have any bearing on any other, and it's, it's really an expedient that the IRS had to, uh, had to take care of in order for people to file their tax returns. It wasn't a decision by Congress mm. on what the fundamental uh, characteristics were that uh, in, in, in these, the difference between ordinary income and capital gain is enormous for tax purposes, and you can't have some uncertainty as it. So I don't think we need to read too much into the. It's 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 merely a notice. It's nothing more than that. It's not again not an act of Congress. So I don't think we should uh, put too much uh, weight on that. I think you make a good point, and a lot of people spend um, a lot of time talking about the IRS ruling on Bitcoin being property. Uh, but Bitcoin is already a, a digital currency. Every single transaction is publicly logged in a ledger, a public ledger. So all the information that's necessary in order to file your taxes, all that data is there. So now we just have to come up with a way to take that data and streamline it in a way that makes sense that the IRS, that's pleasing to the IRS. And now that we have this, uh, you know, a new digital uh, technology as the industry is uh, maturing and as new services begin to emerge, I fully foresee that paying taxes through uh, you know, doing business that operates on the Bitcoin protocol or other digital currency protocols will actually be much, much, much easier than if you were doing operating uh, businesses with uh, traditional currencies. Uh, just because it's already traced, it's already trackable, all we need now is just the software that integrates that. And I, I, I believe eventually taxes will be done automatically and uh, there's a lot of strengths that these types of technologies could bring to IRS transparency, payments, efficiencies. Well, that, that question is a question of information, which is very important, but it doesn't go to the question of characterization, which is what the gentleman over there was talking about. From a characterization point of view, the IRS decided it was going to be property, and as has the Australian government and the, Dutch, the Danish government, other governments have decided the same thing. But the, qu the question of information is a very different question, and you point out that you can't Right, and I think what I'm trying to, to mention is whether the IRS wants to call it property, currency, a, a digital asset, maybe they'll come up with a whole new class in the future for digital currencies that we shouldn't uh, necessarily focus on the complications of how the IRS is ruling it because this is such an innovative technology and it's possible that yeah. the industry can, you know, no matter how the IRS decides to rule it, we can come up with technologies that streamline the efforts uh, completely. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, uh, just a comment that um, with, I believe the number is what, 21 million for the authorized yeah. Bitcoin. Um, it seems that... 100 that million granularity per Bitcoin. Okay. Um, but depending upon what the, the exchange rate is, Bitcoin may never be able to get to a point where it can really make a significant difference in the global economy just by virtue of its limitation of 21,000, uh, 21 million um, you know, authorized Bitcoins, regardless of the granularity. Uh, my comment would be that Bitcoin is similar to, uh, in another industry years ago, let's, let's say uh, sound recordings. Uh, a sound recording was created and you have a copyright. Then it went through a, se uh, a 78, a 33, uh, cassette, uh, DVD, MP3, and digital download. The Bitcoin itself, that particular product, can be similar to any one of those uh, mutations, a CD, a DVD, so on. What the bigger picture is, which I, I guess everyone's finally alluding to, is the cryptocurrency, is the big B, that that's the important thing. There may be a hundred other type of cur cryptocurrencies as the product, but the bigger picture is really the big B, the, the protocol, the decentralized ledger, um, the, the ease of use, the, the reduced cost, not the Bitcoin product itself. The, uh, I had the opportunity at the uh, major Bitcoin conference in Amsterdam earlier this year to sit in with the technologist um, the primarily uh, guys who are working with the algorithm on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, the general consensus was that Bitcoin itself, now this is Bitcoin as opposed to the other types of cryptocurrencies out there, uh, is not likely to become 
the currency for the, the micro payments, the, the payments that you and I would make on a day-to-day -day basis because it's ultimately going to be too expensive, especially as you hit the, the wall on the, on the 21 million and fees start to get assessed with it, plus the cost of compliance has not really been filtered fully into the product. However, we're seeing other, other types of cryptocurrencies that are coming out that sit on top of it, you know, maybe their own creation that, that may have a, a less costly uh, framework that they're operating within, um, but they can rely upon that, that infrastructure that has been built out with, with Bitcoin. Uh, and then that's why you also will probably see other types of digital currencies come into play that offer you know, a, a, a different kind of a way to do transactions. All this is dependent on volumes, and, and it's dependent on Moore's Law, the steady advance of uh, computer technology. At the moment, uh, Bitcoin is embryonic, but as, as it develops, it, uh, will, uh, its costs will drop at, at the Moore's Law pace, which is the, the world's leading learning curve of economic growth. I think I'd, I'd just add one thing to that, too. I think uh, if you look, well, it, this is not from me. This is something, uh, so Jerry Dwyer, former vice president uh, at Atlanta Federal Reserve, uh, has a paper, a new paper out on digital currencies. And if we don't, I, I think we should not get caught in the trap of saying, well, it's fixed at 21 million, so therefore it could never be used for the entire economy. I think that's something we should be cautious of because that's focusing on one narrow aspect of how this thing is used right now. Um, but he draws a really good parallel to using something like a digital currency as a base, as, as we would use high-powered money, base money in the U.S. now. Um, and one of the interesting things is that the total volume dollar-wise right now is actually pretty close to what the base was in the U.S. of U.S. dollars before the recent expansion after the 2008 financial crisis. So um, also paralleling to Milton Friedman's proposal, although he was a rules guy originally. Later on, he did come up with the whole freeze, let's freeze the monetary base and let's people, let, let people economize on how we use the base in, in, in a competitive sort of framework. So I, I don't think it's fair to automatically write it off and say, no, it could never be used throughout the entire economy because of issues like that. We don't really know how this could actually be used yet. And also the price of Bitcoin can potentially become infinitely high. So the price of Bitcoin today, the past couple weeks, has been hovering around $400 per Bitcoin, but there are some who expect the price to go up to a million dollars per Bitcoin. So uh, kind of the same arguments we've seen with gold, where people say there's not enough gold to supply the entire economy, and that's why gold standard doesn't make sense anymore, is kind of the, the same um, argument you, you'd see with here with Bitcoin, is there's not enough Bitcoin to go around. But that value just is a, a measurement. So mm -hmm. saying there's not enough gold or there's not enough Bitcoins in existence is like saying there's not enough rulers in the world to me measure all the inches. Uh, it's kind mm -hmm. of um, uh, a red herring. Diane Katz with Heritage. Uh, you alluded to banking regulators earlier um, and their discomfort at this point with Bitcoin. Last month, uh, well now two months, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, expressed its discomfort to the public by, um, you know, sending out a warning against Bitcoin. And Perry Ann, I'm, I'm curious as to whether we're, you're looking for um, sort of protection from, from Congress maybe, you know, akin to the, the um, you know, the moratorium on internet taxes, say, uh, to, to keep CFPB in particular and other regulators in general from um, interfering and, and basically ending, you know, this experiment before it even gets off the ground. Absolutely, and I believe that education is a big key to this. And uh, on uh, August 29th, the Chamber of Digital Commerce held the first ever Bitcoin Education Day on Capitol Hill, where we visited every single member of the House of Representatives. And uh, uh, we briefed over 70 offices um, on Bitcoin basics. So we believe education is a key uh, part to this. But to address uh, what you were mentioning with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, they issued a very boilerplate advisory on digital currencies and on Bitcoin. And uh, when I was giving my presentation earlier, I, I did say that there's a very important distinction between 
Bitcoin, the protocol, this, the, this computer uh, software, and also the companies that operate on top of that software and that use that software. So with the Chamber, we want to make sure that we're protecting that software, that we're not hindering any kind of innovation, but that we're making sure that we don't have rogue players and that the criminal um, the, the criminal community is not abusing uh, this system and one way that we can do that is uh, to educate the, the regulators and US Congress on the difference between that uh, and then it, we are also pushing for self-regulatory mechanisms so um, the Bitcoin community is decentralized in nature it's kind of like herding cats here and we're still very infant uh, in, in our developments but the community is starting to recognize that uh, consumer best practices or uh, industry best practices are necessary to appease uh, issues uh, like the CFPB is outlining. So we are looking to put together what uh, what are appropriate uh, security protocols to be open and transparent about if you're a company that op operates on this uh, system and, and what as a community can we expect as basic consumer uh, practices and protections uh, and again as a very new decentralized industry you can imagine uh, how difficult it would be to get everybody in the same room to agree on what that would look like uh, but that's you know one of the issues with uh, you know forming the chamber what we wanted to overcome is bringing some kind of centralized uh, notion uh, to address these you know, uh, very uh, reasonable concerns that we're seeing. If I could add a couple of thoughts to, to that. Um, uh, in the legal profession, we, we have the, the saying, bad facts make bad law. Um, the banking regulators um, discomfort with respect to the concept of Bitcoin came from, quite honestly, a lot of innuendo for a long time about the misuse of, of Bitcoin in criminal activity. And in some ways, just about a year ago, when the Silk Road indictment finally came down, that was, in a lot of ways, the best thing that could have happened to Bitcoin the Bitcoin movement because it finally allowed us to, to put a fence around what it was that was causing the concern. And much like what I had suggested in the Eagle case, it wasn't that Bitcoin itself was illegal, it was the way people were using it. Um, and, and that's what crystallized now, you know, the problem is is that there's been additional cases that have come off of Silk Road and, you know, undoubtedly, I mean, one of the th one of the things we know is that criminals are the first adopters of new and emerging technology, uh, payments technologies, and they will use and abuse until the, s the, the controls are put into place, much like what I had said with uh, uh, Jennifer Shasky Calvary's comments to, uh, yesterday. Um, so, so this is this is addressing it with the educational issues with the regulators, uh, getting them more comfortable that they understand it. Also, getting the banking industry itself more comfortable. And I've spent a lot of time over the last several months uh, before banking groups uh, talking about the differences between the capital B Bitcoin and the small B Bitcoin, uh, and and giving them again the framework in which to analyze it to so that they can get over their discomfort because that. That will then play off into, into the regulators. Um, and then finally, with respect to the CFPB action, uh, again, that was not totally in a vacuum. The GAO had been asked by the um, uh, Senate uh, Committee on Homeland Security to conduct a study. Uh, interestingly enough, the one finding or recommendation that made out of that study, which when you think Homeland Security, you think law enforcement community and so on, was that you know they didn't really have a whole lot to say about you know what needed to be done in in that world, but they said the CFPB needs to get to the table, <laughs> um, CFPB. and CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection okay. Bureau, and um, oh and when the CFPB did come to the table, they had a couple of interesting points in their in their document, um, but the SEC had already been there by writing a similar type of guidance a number of months ago, as well as the state banking uh, regulators through the Conference of State Bank Supervisors had already put out a massive disclosure. So we already had a lot of that out before the, 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 uh, this most recent one came out. Yeah, I, my expectation is they're just getting started. That, you know, to, that it would be you know, rational to expect that there's going to be a lot more coming from the city. Absolutely. And I think it's safe to say that almost every area of the government today is, is getting themselves better educated with it, as is the banking industry. And going back to the gentleman's question a little earlier, is that uh, many, of the banking many of the larger banks have projects underway now 
where they are looking at Bitcoin. And they're looking at it some from the currency, but more from the protocol standpoint. Um, but they're also looking at how they're going to play in this world of digital currencies into the future. And so the concept of having multi-currency accounts is not something that's, that's um, uh, that they haven't thought about and that they're not thinking about how you're going to get to it. And the banking regulators, in fact, recognize, or at least one of them recognizes, that we're going to be at that point of, of multi-currency accounts in, that will include digital currencies in the not too distant future. Uh, Terry Miller from the Heritage Foundation. And I'm certainly not a fan of regulation, but in this case, I would have to say that I'm, I'm actually glad that the regulators are taking a look at this, a close look at this. Um, I, I very much appreciate the last two comments by uh, Ms. Van Cleef and Ms. Boring, but this um, whole concept trips every warning signal that I've built up over my whole life about financial scams. Um, it just seems like there's an incredible potential for abuse here. Uh, perhaps not for the most sophisticated users, but for those who are less sophisticated. Um, and I, I just wonder if, you, if the panelists would comment on that. Again, I'd like to go back to my very first comment that 74% of the world's population does not have access to basic financial services. I think the greatest amount of abuse is in our traditional financial system, which came to a screeching halt in 2008, which was really the culprit of why I decided to move to Washington and get involved in economic policy to begin with. As someone that comes from a very small town in Florida, I'm from Lakeland, Florida, the, the housing market. Um, you, bust and I don't know anybody that wasn't negatively affected in my community from that economic collapse. And uh, as a, an economic student at the University of Florida, I, I spent a lot of time doing a lot of diligence of our financial system. And what I found is that our financial system is really based on essentially a house of cards. And there's a lot of people that are excluded from that system. Here in the United States, over 50% of Americans don't have access to bank accounts, credit cards. How is the traditional banking, service, uh, t traditional banking um, system uh, servicing these people? There's not really much of an answer. But now that we have a, a system, Bitcoin, that is free, it's open, it's transparent, it potentially can bring a lot of people into the system that have been excluded for a very long time. Third world, particularly. I mean, the, that is the real reason that uh, Hernando de Soto, the great theorist of property rights, uh, welcomed the emergence of the blockchain, of uh, Bitcoin's uh, timestamp ledger of transactions, because uh, he believed it was a way to have an autonomous global title uh, list that uh, would uh, release and allow to be monetized many of the assets of the third world that are currently muddled by uh, conflicting title chain uh, claims and uh, murky uh, chains of ownership. And so he, he actually could see some $300 billion worth of uh, global assets uh, becoming uh, uh, collateralized essentially through the application of, of uh, the Bitcoin blockchain of time stamped uh, unimpeachable transactions. I think we have time for one more, one more question. Hi, Andy Roth with the Club for Growth. Um, since the Heritage Foundation is all about conservative <coughs> ideas, I, the, the three big conservative ideas I can think of that relate to, to Bitcoin is immigration with remittance <coughs> payments. Um, I just think that the ability to for a migrant worker picking avocados in California to send money back to Mexico using Bitcoin rather than through more traditional ways, that's an explosive market to me or, or anywhere else in the world. Um, two, the gold standard. I think a lot of people in this room support the gold standard. And you've talked about gold-backed uh, cryptocurrency. It's my opinion, I think, that we don't want Bitcoin backed by gold because gold is centralized and the whole part of cryptocurrency is decentralization. And then the third current, the third issue is foreign policy. 
like the big, great, awesome idea about Bitcoin is that we can destroy tyrants and, and get rid of regimes that inflate their currencies to, to kill people and, and do all sorts of nasty things. On those three issues, immigration, gold standard, and foreign policy, those seem like the biggest things to me with Bitcoin. Does anybody have anything to say about those three? Well, my book is uh, Bitcoin and Gold, and I, I think the key to both of them is the recognition that as uh, in capitalism, uh, goods and services become increasingly abundant, uh, the money has to have a basis beyond uh, the mere proliferation of goods and services, which raises the question of what becomes scarce when everything else becomes abundant. And uh, uh, with the expansion of abundance, the pressure of scarcity migrates to the residual resource, which is time. Time is the one irreversible uh, and unexpandable resource. Uh, that uh, on which all money values ultimately repose. And uh, uh, currencies will be effective to the extent that they reflect this fundamental scarcity. And uh, gold reflects it by canceling uh, advances of technology and capital through uh, the ne necessity of drilling ever deeper below the earth as uh, uh, the mining process continues. Uh, Bitcoin is explicitly cancels capital through its algorithm, which uh, increases the difficulty of the process of, of verification as the uh, uh, system expands. So that uh, both of them are founded on this residual resource of time. And uh, at the beginning, Bitcoin uh, is, uh, is a conflict between property rights and currencies and all these definitions, but because today it is chiefly or largely an investment. Uh, people are speculating on its ultimate success as a currency. And, uh, but as uh, it becomes established as a currency, I, th I think that uh, you know, it, it begins on the internet. And as internet commerce expands, it, at the beginning, uh, we will uh, want to know how many dollars our bitcoins are worth. But as time passes and internet commerce grows, it will increasingly become of interest how uh, many bitcoins our dollars are worth. And uh, ultimately, uh, internet commerce increasingly automated and uh, with the new um, information system uh, for commerce on top of it that Bitcoin epitomizes, I think uh, uh, is a long-term uh, uh, entrepreneurial advance of capitalism, and I think we should all support it. And just to, uh, I appreciate your comments on uh, while there's many reasons Bitcoin would uh, appeal to a conservative audience. This is not in any way or shape or form a partisan issue or should it ever become one? Bitcoin is about technology and innovation and if we are able uh, to uh, get the regulatory structure in a way that's appeasing to uh, this town on both sides of the aisle, uh, there's many benefits that we can bring to uh, Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals, anarchists, uh, wherever you may sit. <laughs> <laughs> There, there's many types of technological innovations that can be built on top of this. And I'd like to add, I think that I'm not sure we'll ever satisfy the anarchist uh, <laughs> by definition. <laughs> um, but uh, if you're interested, there is a report out, maybe you've seen it, M MSNBC uh, reported on a um, meeting between Bitcoin Foundation this past week and military, uh, as well as, I guess, other members of the law enforcement community uh, about the concerns of, of how these technologies can be used by terrorists, can be used by destabilizing uh, environments. So again, we're in a little bit of a race of a t uh, for time here to make sure that, that the policymakers fully understand um, what's there and, and we figure out together what an appropriate roadmap looks like going forward uh, for these innovations. I think there's no question though that, that the, the day and age of digital currencies has come. 
um, it's going to push, I think, the existing financial systems towards uh, uh, delivering products and services on a more timely basis, and it's probably accelerated the pressure on the Federal Reserve and their efforts to get towards same-day settlement that we don't even have with, with this new technology out there that's promising uh, immediate settlement uh, of transactions. Um, so I, I, we're in for a very interesting ride. I think that what Perry Ann's doing with the, the chamber is, is fundamentally, I mean, it's, it's critically important um, to make sure that we've got uh, the right framework from a legislative and regulatory frame uh, perspective going forward. Right. Okay. Well, in support of George's proposition, we are out of time. So thank you all for coming, and I want to thank our panelists. For <laughs>